Hello and welcome to this, the second of a series of interviews where we take the opportunity of talking with prominent members. Now today I have the great pleasure of talking with Bill Woolworth, CBE, who has been our learning clerk since 2014. Let me just say good afternoon. It's great to see you, Bill. Um, and uh, why don't we start off uh, with some of the reminiscences from your uh, early life? Let's start there and move on. Well, I, I have to say this is a, a great honour and most unexpected. And following on from Edward is, is going to be a very hard challenge. Um, however, uh, my I was brought up in a small village in uh, in Western Wiltshire, right on the borders between Wiltshire and Dorset, Somerset, called Mere, and um, went to school in Shaftesbury, which was a local grammar school. Um, my father had been in the Royal Navy during the Second World War, the youngest leading hand, leading seaman in the Mediterranean fleet, so he told me proudly, and a right something, something, something he was too. My godfather, who was a barrister, was his messmate. And um, uh, we sailed as kids. Rugby was very much part of our upbringing. My father was a very good player. And um, and then when I was getting towards O levels, the thoughts about what on earth am I going to do for a living? It seems extraordinary to think about it now, but there were four young men in the village who were at sea in the Merchant Navy. And um, nowadays, you're lucky to find four people in Wiltshire who are in the Merchant Navy. Um, and so it was that I found myself as a 16 year old on board British captain, um, which was a very early all after accommodation. Um, uh, well, early large crude carrier, 60,000 tons. Um, and I had a fantastic training with BP um, and stayed with them for about uh, 10 years, during which time tankers went from that 60,000 tonne up to 250,000 tonnes crude oil ships and very much more complex product carriers as well. Um, it was great fun and a phenomenal training. Uh, I left in 1978, I have to say, slow steaming in the, in the uh, oil crisis of the late 70s didn't do me any good round to the Persian Gulf and taking three months about it and then the same amount of time coming back. Um, so I left and joined the RFA and it was actually... Um, how difficult was that, Bill? How, dif how difficult was that to, to move out of BP and, uh, uh, and join the RFA? Um, I found it really easy and um, I arrived just at the right time. The Navy had withdrawn, or the UK had withdrawn from our foreign bases and the Navy was turning expeditionary. I was working out of the UK and taking its logistic train with it. And um, as I said, I've had a, thin, a very, very good training with BP and I slotted in very quickly. My first captain, who I got to know very, very well, um, so we've never been asked so many questions in such a short amount of time. And <laughs> two years later, I was a staff officer in London. So um, that was a good relationship that, that uh, carried me for some years. Um, the, the RFA in those days was, was changing. It was having to, as was the Navy. Um, and then we got to uh, the Falklands War, where the RFA were virtually all of us were used in one way or another, either in RFAs, virtually all of which ended up going south, or in the ships taken up from trade running the Navy teams, which was my job in a ship called Saxonia, which was a beautiful reefer carrying bananas from the West Indies to Europe and commandeered. Um, but when I came back, I went straight into the RFA headquarters with the task of, of writing uh, the drafting, rather, the RFA report of proceedings on what had happened. And uh, the RFA had performed exceptionally well, but we knew very little about warfare um, and weren't expected to. So the outcome was really to be a truly expeditionary in the Navy. The Navy had to be able to take its fleet train with it, which it hadn't had to do since the um, Second World War Pacific campaign. Um, and, uh, and that involved spending a lot of money in training RFA 
uh, or taking the whole right task into um, into the Royal Navy right. as opposed to the equivalent auxiliary. I know a lot of things happened out of that, but we started training principal warfare officers, specialist navigators, and our officers started doing um, regular staff courses with the Navy and uh, the armed forces. And um, our ratings became far better trained. And then we started uh, fitting our own self-defense weapons to ships, which ended up being really quite sophisticated. So my last ship in command, Fort Victoria, was, was well equipped to go anywhere with the fleet. Um, and uh, we, I might be talking about that a little bit later. So in those, um, in those um, 20 years, there was vast change. By the time I left, we were directly employed by the commander in chief fleet, who was my line manager. And um, if you like, and I was one of his type of, uh, I was one of his um, heads of fighting arm, and um, and the RFA was was another part of the navy with the fleet air arm, the submarine service, and uh, and the and the um, and the surface navy. So that that's how it all changed over those twenty or thirty years uh, to the organisation it is now. And and I know that we're very proud to be. I say we, the RFA is very proud to be affiliated. Um, to the fuelers. It's been a great relationship. So that was me with a foot in both camps. <laughs> um, from there on, I, I, was, I was very lucky. I, uh, my career in the RFA just really took off. I, I worked for all the bosses at one point or another in, in staff roles, as well as commanding ships and um, ending up as the head of service, which was essentially chief exec. So, um, and that's until 2013 when I retired the first time. <laughs> um, I guess there were the highlights in that. Obviously, in terms of things you remember, the Falklands War was right there, or I was very fortunate, but at no point at all did I get shot at or bombed, um, unlike many of my friends. But we had some exciting times in Saxonia. It was a ship for a, with an absolutely brilliant captain who had very little idea of what was going on in the general war aspect of it, but was a wonderful shipmaster. Um, and uh, he was Welsh and a supporter of Cardiff rugby, which made life even more fun because we'd just beaten them. Uh, we perhaps talk about rugby later. Um, and I know Chloe Andrews Jones, if she does miss this, won't be impressed by that story. <laughs> um, uh, so the Falklands were, were a great highlight, uh, as I've said, in professional terms, I uh, enjoyed it, even though I uh, lost a couple of friends and um, it was pretty disastrous for a lot of people. It was a huge success for the country and the RFA did exceptionally well. <coughs> um, I think other things I did which were really interested were, uh, I got involved in, um, in my first command, in Sir Galahad, the, the, the new Sir Galahad. Really? Across the other one. We started off in northern Norway with the Royal Marines for three months playing, um, exercising in the old forward maritime strategy where the Soviet forces would come streaming over the border in the Finnish wedge and uh, 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 United, uh, sorry, NATO task force and the UK, um, Netherlands maritime, uh, Marine force would um, would fight them off with the Allied Command Europe team. Um, it, it was all very exciting stuff. And driving up and down Norwegian fields in the middle of the night with a ship full of Royal Marines and helicopters buzzing around over the top, it was fantastically exciting as well as professionally very demanding. <laughs> and um, and we, we we made some great friends up there. Um, Although one of the most extraordinary things that happened was, <coughs> I was, um, we just had a Sunday morning and we were at the top of a field. It was blowing freezing cold. And I was out on the open area on the side of a bridge called the Bridge Wing. And um, uh, what, what I thought was a, was a Royal Marine, but wasn't, came out on the Bridge Wing. He was a, a lieutenant colonel and the boss of the team who were on board. And he was, uh, he, there I realized he wasn't a Royal Marine. And I asked what, what his background was, and he said, oh, I'm a 
Remy. I said, oh, my best pal at school went to the Remy. Then I said, I'm not going to waste your time telling you his name because I haven't seen him for 40 years and the army's an enormous organisation. And Henry said, well, come on then, try me. And I told him his name, this guy's name, <coughs> and he said, Smarty, he might have been your best mate at school. He's my best mate in the army. <laughs> there and then. <laughs> there and then phoned him up. I haven't spoke to this guy since, oh, as I said, for many, many years. And there we were. This bizarre situation. Um, he was somewhere out of the Middle East. And we were at the top of a field in Norway, chattering away. It was so funny. Anyway, <clears throat> but then we ended up getting sent to Angola in the, uh, the final stages of the Civil War. Um, uh, Sir Galahad was there as a getaway ship, really, and logistic hub for a group of uh, Brits who were there to help. Um, uh, we were under the command of a Nigerian Major General who was commanding the United Nations force there, and our role was to um, facilitate eight troop contributing nations um, who were going to police the the um, <coughs> disarming of uh, of the um, of the guys who were coming in from the bush. Um, so that was the that was the main task. But I had a very very enterprising executive officer who um, who knew I didn't want us just to sit alongside daydreaming, and we had to go up to. Um, we were based in a, in a small port, a uh, large port actually, down in the south of uh, Angola, but had to go up to Luanda. And while we was there, he traipsed off to the United Nations to say, well, we've got a ship full of stuff going back that, with loads of space if you want stuff moved. Um, but he came back with a big grin all over his face and said, right, I've got something we can move, but I've also got us three cars. Um, a minibus, a truck, and a Toyota Land Cruiser for you. And that's the that's the cost of the freight. So we were mobile. Um, once we got back, we had our own vehicles, so we didn't have to borrow them from the army. And from that, we were able to help build a school out of rubble and rocks for children, um, uh, street children, of which there are very, very many. Um, and uh, working for another NGO, we 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 helped an enormous amount on the with the non-governmental organisations and the charities. And, um, and I've got a ship made out of um, milk powder tins um, still in downstairs in our house, which, I, which is my favorite memory of the, whole, of the whole place. But that was Angola. It was, um, we arrived um, and the place was in total disrepair, but just the money that we brought in for 600 Brits brought in money. Um, I don't know it's a desperate situation, but it's a, a was able to seed some kind of industry just in the town that had been dead for several years. Well done. Well, well done. It, was, it was a wonderful, extraordinary experience. And I found myself, um, then the ship, the ship developed itself as, as really quite a hub. And at one time I had 13 ambassadors and the USN, the UN special representative on board. And I walked around a corner and there was the American ambassador talking to the Russian one. I'm really, really sorry, sir. Normally, you had an ambassador join a ship. There's bells and whistles and jumping up and down. And there I had two from the biggest nations in the world. I didn't even know they were on board. Anyway, that was it was a fabulous <laughs> occasion and, and one of those memories. And so, if I ever meet up anybody from that trip, um, we, we, we always go straight back to it. It, it was absolutely fascinating and, and seeing politics um, and uh, refugees and the desperate situations that people have been forced into and street children begging for food is not a pretty sight but you it's, it's uh, I'm sorry that what sounded really crass street children for begging for food is a terrible sight um, and especially if you know there are thousands of them but we work very closely with the non-governmental organizations to try and alleviate the misery that these poor children were in and um, helping to shepherd them towards um, refugee camps or schools or something. But the, they were tiny ones who were just left by their parents or not left by their parents who were lost during the, the civil war. Um, and while we all knew about the, um, 
the terrible siege of Sarajevo. At the same time, there was a bigger one going on in, in, in Angola, where a lot of families were lost, killed parents just trying to get back to the coast. It's great and to have the opportunity, great to have the opportunity to make that level of contribution. <laughs> Well, I, it was, and the, the ship did very well, and um, we, we got uh, Sharon Wilkinson's sort of piece for that year, and I was honoured with an OBE, so, um, which, as I made very, very clear, was, was to be shared by the ship's company. Yes. Uh, I was very fortunate to be part of the task group that went out to the Far East um, at the, when we withdrew from Hong Kong. It was... Um, a, a, a task group around um, HMS Illustrious, um, and the boss was a, a, a Rear Admiral um, Alan West, <coughs> now Lord West of Spithead, um, and he spoke at, uh, I think he was our first um, speaker at Affiliate, so as I was ringing up people I thought might help, and I know him uh, fairly well, so that worked. Um, and that was, again, a fascinating trip. We worked all the way around um, through the UK, through the Mediterranean, and out through the canal, um, and uh, out as far as uh, as Japan, working with all the navies that we we were friends with all on the way out. And um, I, I was driving a ship called Diligence, which was a forward repair ship and diving support ship, and the most ugly and slow ship in the entire task force, if not painted gray with a number on the side, but it was huge fun. And um, we were not quite fast enough to keep up with the task group when they were trotting along. So we used to detach ourselves. And, um, and I knew enough about how the game was played to make sure that if we weren't with the task group, we were sitting in a jolly good port somewhere. And I do remember the captain of the aircraft carrier coming up and accosting me at a, a reception somewhere and saying, right, I know you'll never tell me exactly how fast your ship can do, but would you please make sure that um, if you do fall out, that you're over the horizon when the Admiral walks on the flag bridge in the morning, so I don't get it up. What's that ship doing over there? <laughs> um, and you complied, of course. <laughs> Naturally, it was easy to comply with that one. But that was, uh, we, we talked earlier about um, things that, uh, that, that, uh, that make you laugh and uh, things that startle you. We were also, we, our principal role out right there was as the submarine support ship. So we had HMS Trenchant, and, um, whose captain was a very good pal of mine anyway, so that was useful. And we ended up in Subic Bay which had been an enormous American air, uh, naval base and, uh, and air station and had been featured very, um, uh, it was a major role in the Vietnam War. Um, by the time we arrived there, it was back owned by the Philippines as a free port. Uh, they were very pleased to see us, but we'd been well briefed on, on our role and it was not to have a great time in Subic Bay. It was there to show UK support to um, to our former and current friends in uh, in those in those waters and um, and to continue to display that level of friendship. And the defence attaché um, said by the and to David the captain the submarine and I right um, tomorrow morning so tonight was a reception in the blah blah blah. Tomorrow morning at nine o'clock, there'll be a press facility. Bill, can you be doing it on your flight deck? Yes, that's not a problem. Um, Lots be local press, don't worry, nothing particularly serious, but just don't tell them your boys are looking forward to going into the bars. <clears throat> so um, when I, with David and I strolled onto the flight deck the next morning with, with the uh, defense attaché, there were about 30 cameras there and he'd rather underestimated exactly the level of interest. And so the, it turned out that a very, um, a, a very keen young journalist um, was, the, uh, was the Philippines equivalent of Good Morning Britain or one of the, uh, one of the, the major shows on the television. And uh, first question up was, um, was to the captain of the submarine, have you got any nuclear weapons on board? Um, he said, well, I haven't, better ask Bill, which wasn't the star fight, so I was pretty amazed at that, but anyway, so I, 
submarines booked. Anyway, so we moved on from that. The next question to me was, could you confirm that you and the task group are in, in these waters to support us in our conflict with the Chinese over the Spratly Islands, which are the disputed islands in the China Sea that you may have heard of, which at which point the defense attache went pale and my brain started to work extremely fast. Anyway, I managed to pull off a really quite convincing answer. Thank you very much, uh, the staff college, which at least had taught me to cuff it. And, uh, and we moved on from that one, but it was the sight of the defense attache going into the vapors at the thought of some random captain who's appeared in his country answering a question like that. Um, and then we moved on from that, fortunately. But that was well done. Well done. <laughs> and um, I'm sure you're going to edit something in here worth listening to. Uh, and my final trip to sea was after another spell in the fleet headquarters <clears throat> as a director of RFA operations. I was driving a ship called Fort Victoria, which is actually affiliated to the Carmen. And that was my first, my first meeting with the with the livery. And uh, uh, my boss phoned me up and said, we're now going to be affiliated to a livery company. And this was before the RFA had ever been affiliated to livery companies. And I said, oh yeah, really, what's that about? And um, with slightly more respect to my tone than that. And um, he said, well, this is what it's about. Do you want to be the first ship? Um, I said, well, sure, we're up for anything in Port Victoria and um, bring them down. So we we were in Portland pre preparing to go to work up before an operational deployment. So we were, everything was being washed, brushed and exercised. Everybody was rushing around madly and the team from the Carmen turned up, by which time I understood what was going on. And I told as many of my guys as I could possibly do, but they had a great time on board. They emptied the wardroom bar and they all jumped in their cars and drove home again. Um, so that was my first, my first contact with the livery. Not much has changed, Phil. Not, Not much, much has changed. changed. In some respects, no. <laughs> um, and then, um, and then I, um, and then I, I became um, head of service and was invited to a number of twos. And, and absolutely, one of the highlights, of, without shadow of doubt, was um, Stuart Goldsmith's installation, which is a wonderful affair. And um, uh, and I thought, wow, this is this is terrific. And at that stage, I had no idea about the professional side of the fuel, as I just thought it was a cracking evening out. Um, and um, and then Paul Cuttle invited me to be his speaker at um, his midsummer court dinner, I think, on Wellington. I I, I can't remember. It was good fun. Either way, round um, Prince Edward was actually. I think he'd just um, been um, uh, enrobed as a uh, as a um, an honorary liveryman. Yes, enrobed, not the right word, but anyway, he'd just become an honorary liveryman. Either way around, I was under a fair amount of scrutiny because I used to. He was commodore in chief of the RFA, and I'd organised his um, visit to one of our ships to present our, our royal standard um, when I was head of operations and then I'd called on him every six months throughout my time as head of the RFA um, as I said he was commodore in chief just to keep him up to date with what we were up to and to let him know the kind of issues that we really wanted him to throw his weight against if he was talking to the right people which as it transpired was a useful connection when I joined the RFA. So, uh, sorry, when I when I uh, retired from the RFA. So it was a yes. useful connection when I which I when I retired from the RFA. So I had five years as the as the boss, and um, during that time uh, we were very very operational. If you it wasn't that long after. Well, it, during the whole counter piracy, there were still huge issues with transits in and out of the Gulf. And so uh, we went out in a task group. Um, my ship, Fort Victoria, uh, was very, very well equipped. And we had um, four, sometimes five, and the headquarters of 814 Naval Air Squadron, which was all Merlin. 
and we had um, two Royal Marine boarding parties for um, for inspecting um, boats, ships, dows that we wanted to find out what they were up to. Uh, that was fascinating business. We we were um, 500 miles away from the aircraft carrier, which is about as close as you want to get to one if you're in another ship, and um, and roaming up and down the Somali basin and the uh, and the coast off the Oman and the Yemen, um, keeping outside territorial waters, but but uh, on intelligence-based um, stopping dows and sending our boys over to them, which led actually to one fantastic occasion where where we got a message back from the boarding officer that the dow was a bit short of water and could we help? Within seconds, a pallet of water bottles that appeared on the deck and cranes were rigged and I said no 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 stop 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 we're not going to do it like that there's a photograph in this and an illustration of how the Brits are doing stuff so so I, uh, I, we slowed the ship right down to, uh, well, we, to three or four knots walking pace as slow as we could get it and I told the, the the boarding officer to get the Dow to drive up towards alongside us and uh, the guys on deck to had to use the deck hose and then they had to attach another and we passed them a hose from our deck to the deck of the dam. The bottom captain was standing on the back end of the dam and they're rushing, rushing forwards and his boys were all standing on looking astonished as this massive ship and they were down there, <laughs> we were up there. Everybody thought I was completely bonkers but the ship nearly healed over by it. every single person who could come out and watch did. And of course it was a great reference to the fact that um, one of the, the way we put fuel across was by six inch hoses from damn great derricks on the side of the ship to the receiving points on warships and uh, we took fuel the same way as well when we were deployed so it was made a fantastic photograph and it uh, and it was published in the sun on the second page um, where they normally had other things published but anyway we made we made the the national press with a photograph of this terrific August terrific season. absolutely hilarious and uh the boys were all convinced after that that I was completely mad, not just pretended. But anyway, it was a, it was a, it was a, it was a great occasion. But we roamed all over, uh, as I said, on, on that trip, including the fascinating period working with the Indian Navy uh, for a couple of weeks with um, visits and um, uh, fascinating. One of those scenes that you never forget was a reception in in the naval headquarters in Mumbai, um, which was a beautiful green lawn at sunset, ladies dressed in beautiful saris, the men as smart as smart in the white and a, beautiful, and a wonderful band playing in the corner and cocktails with the moon shining down. I shall never, ever forget it. And then, um, and then as I said, finished that back to the headquarters to fight off commercial uh, raiders who wanted to take the RFA away from the Navy, but we managed to beat them off too. Well done. So that was the RFA. <laughs> Did I ramble a bit there, Michael? I'm sorry. No, not at all. Not at all, Bill. No. Was there uh, enough out of that? All to... good, uh, fascinating stuff. Was there enough out of there to get us? Oh, yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. Do you want to get on and talk about uh, livery and Joining right, did you, did you want to know what I you said what I do for my spare time, all right? Yes, yes, okay. let's do that. Right. Yes, so, so if I say to you, um, uh, okay, Bill, running alongside your livery activities, what else is uh, uh, currently interesting you? Um, oh well, yeah, I, I, I'm. I, I, I'll mention in a minute how I ended up uh, being the fueler's clerk. I'm sure, but. Yes. Um, Around about the same time, I was um, interviewed to be one of the, I was already a younger brother at Trinity House, to be one of the elder brethren on the board. Um, and I do that, and that um, includes uh, uh, the two charities. We're the biggest donor charity in the, um, in the, in the maritime sector. Um, I'm also on the examiners committee um, where we set the voyage and uh, navigation standards for around the UK and in harbours um, and that involves um, one week a year disappearing off. We used to go off in one of the tenders to 
uh, visit lighthouses and um, uh, light um, uh, night shifts. Um, that was always good fun. Um, unfortunately, this year it was suspended for quite reasonable reasons. Um, so we did it by road instead. But um, that is a fascinating reflection back on what I used to do for a living. Um, one of the more interesting ones of those is that um, we also act as mariners' assistants in Admiralty Court, where, um, where these days very uh, few navigational incidents end up in court, which, um, but they do. And, and back in July, um, two of us were, uh, said, uh, assessors at Admiralty Court on a spectacular collision, um, and uh, it was fascinating stuff. I mentioned my father's best pal who'd been in the same mess deck as him in HMS um, Liverpool. Um, he was a, a Queen's Council and a leading light in Admiralty Court and took me to see him in action one day when I was in my, I had one stripe then. And at the end of it, he said, what do you, what do you make of this? And um, so what do you think about it all? And I said, well, first thing is, um, if anybody ever invites me to be an expert witness, I shall decline very smartly after seeing what you did to one didn't cross his mind and certainly didn't cross my mind that I might have ended up sitting on the other side of the bench but anyway it was it was a, <laughs> it was good and all I could think about was him my father from whichever dimension above or below looking at it and shaking their heads um, so I do that I was then asked if I'd chair something called the Maritime Skills Alliance which is essentially the skills organization for the wet bit of the shipping industry or the maritime industry really from harbour through to all the different various ways of going to sea around the UK coast, inland waters and deep sea. We've got 26 members, something like that. Um, and um, from that, I ended up um, chairing the Maritime UK People and Skills Group. Maritime UK is a representational body for the UK maritime and marine industries. What, we would have called generic shipping industry in the past, but that covers everything from shipbuilding, ship repair, technology. Um, huge focus these days on automation, huge focus on green energy and solutions to um, transports of ships. Um, and Chris Lefebvre is very interested in that as are other members of the fuelers um, and how we man to the future. Um, and the other major drama going on at the moment is COVID-19 related, where we had uh, men and women scattered around the world trying to get off ships, to get home to their families or on ships to relieve the guys who want to get off. Yes. People being very redundant, people are going off pay, people have been away from home for a year and are exhausted <coughs> and um, miss their families. And so if you live in a small village in somewhere that hasn't got a mobile phone mast, you're completely snookered and you're yes. stuck in a harbour somewhere and unable to even go ashore so it's disastrous and a lot of UK guys are um, people are being made redundant so all of the ships swinging around anchors that you see off Bournemouth and Weymouth and Lyme Bay um, a lot of the people who used to work on those have, have already been made redundant so it's pretty awful scene and we're looking at how on earth we can retrain them and to keep them in the industry that's the Maritime Schools Alliance, Maritime UK, which I, uh, I chair. I'm the principal of a small sailing charity, which the, um, the Fuelers Charitable Trust are kind enough to provide the fuel for our rescue boats. So, we, so it, it was set up in 1974 to, um, by a policeman, a sergeant in the local police to, um, to try and uh, introduce um, young people from this estate in particular into being on a boat it's not sailing um it seemed to be a, a rather expensive sport but it is fabulous for learning about teamwork and your own self-confidence and self-development and and kids very young can progress so you can move from an RYA qualification very young um and be helming a boat when your mum won't let you out on a bicycle on your own and uh, it's, it's hugely beneficial to the children it's great fun for us volunteers because most of us were navy or merchant navy and it's crack when we're all retired and um, do a huge amount of good so uh, the charitable trust fund are very 
kindly contribute um, to our rescue boat fund. It's a very worthy cause, Bill. Well, it is actually. Um, it, it, it does. And um, we count our success as the number of children who get the qualification and the number who end up going to sea or into the maritime industry. So it, it, it's good. I also beat up shipwrights and master mariners and Trinity House for money. And I'm pleased to say it was very successful as well. So uh, that was another literary connection that came in handy. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> um, then there's rugby. Um, uh, I played for the Bath Club in the 70s. Um, uh, I, was not, um, uh, I was not a first team player by any uh, standard, but um, I, uh, I loved But you it. did play for them once. I did play for them once, indeed, on a county <laughs> game when most of the first team were off playing for uh, Somerset or Gloucestershire or Dorset Wolves. Anyway, that was good fun. Um, and, um, but I played a lot of rugby in South Wales uh, uh, as well as, uh, as around. West of England uh, and, and the other good clubs. Uh, it was it was great fun, uh, and I ended up um, playing my last game at 42, having gone from wing three quarters to Bath for hooker for um, Northern Gypsy, which was a uh, anyway. There we go. That was that was rugby. I played tennis, but I came off a bicycle. Having um, uh, I rode a bike from Lands End to John Groats in 2004, just was feeling a bit of a loose end on a Friday, bought the bike on the Friday afternoon and set off on the Monday. Oh, gracious. It wasn't really very well planned at all, but it took <laughs> 12 days. It was the most therapeutic thing I've ever done. But because it, I hadn't told anybody I was going to do it other than Jane, um, I, it was met with disbelief and get out of it. You don't talk so much about it. But actually, it was phenomenally interesting thing to do and pedaling downhill into jolly groats was well because of the strength of the wind yes. is one of those experiences that you don't forget that was huge fun um so those are the sort of things i i do when i'm not doing my funeral's time and how did you join the livery anyway bill how did how did that all happen i mentioned the connection with um, the Earl of Wessex's team. Um, his private secretary um, was going to retire and the Earl of Wessex um, had a reception for him at Buckingham Palace to which I was um, honored to be invited. At that reception, I met um, Sir Anthony Reardon Smith who asked me how I was enjoying retirement. Um, this was about six months in of retirement, I would guess. Well, after you've been as busy as we've been and I hadn't really planned it too much, um, walking the dog along the beach was beginning to wane us fun. And um, so he told me about the funeral's job, three days a week, sounded fun. <clears throat> and um, my wife rather reluctantly agreed. She had got ideas of, what she wanted me to do, which involved her allotment in the garden. And um, I'd been predominantly a flat dweller until we got married 10 years ago. And um, so uh, the next thing I knew, I was really sitting in front of David Court, John Ingham, and um, uh, explaining why I thought I might be the answer to the viewers' prayers, um, how wrong I was. But anyway, <laughs> the. Um, then a hilarious occasion, uh, uh, whichever court it was, and I, I can't recall, um, Dennis was still master, I think, and announced with great aplomb, apparently in the court meeting, that um, perhaps you'd now like to meet our new clerk, at which point Stuart, who was late for the meeting, opened the door and walked in. Immediate past master, I think, at that point. No, it's not him. Get out of the way. <laughs> and then I was really good. Um, uh, the first year was traumatic for everyone, particularly for Neville, who was uh, the master, who was learning how to be master at the same time as I was learning how to be clerk. Um, I have to say, though, Neville and I um, uh, 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 agreed to become friends, or rather he agreed to be friends, you know, not too long afterwards. And I'm pleased to say it only took joy until about 2018 to forgive me for not getting a proper seat in, in the... In the um, United Guild Service, uh, but I, 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 enjoyed, I enjoyed their company hugely. 
Um, and uh, if my CV ever gets as complicated as Neville's, I'll, um, I will be in serious trouble for my wife. <laughs> um, so I started in um, 2014. Um, and uh, the first major uh, uh, thing I, the first major uh, event I um, helped organize was the Royal Charter yes. dinner in the Guildhall, which was pretty spectacular. Um, uh, and the first time I wrote a detailed um, timeline for an event, which looked spookily like an operations order to anybody who'd come back from where I'd worked before. <clears throat> I should add that I ended up doing the higher command staff course um, in, uh, in 2001, which was the senior staff course that the armed forces could provide. And I put all my tertiary education down to the defense and um, I was remarkably lucky. Um, <clears throat> and that of course, were where the Earl of Wessex um, presented the Royal Charter to the funerals. If you ask me where that connection might be useful or might have been useful. Of course, um, Neville uh, Chamberlain had asked um, uh, His Royal Highness if he would consider being master. And he had responded in a uh, in enough of a positive way to be worth pursuing. Yes. And in this discussion about, well, how on earth do we go about it from now on? I was able to provide the answer. I'll wing up his staff and we'll take it from there. And, um, and then in due course, John Ingham and I visited Buckingham Palace. And, um, and from there on the, the idea started to take root. It was still a lot of work to push it over the line. Um, and John and uh, Chloe Andrews Jones did an enormous amount of work because it led to a, a question of why do you want a royal master in the funerals? and what will be the benefits. At about the same time in 2014, I'd written a paper to myself on what on earth is this all about? What is a living? Which maybe I should have done a year earlier, but um, uh, a whole lot of things uh, that paid it. But Chloe, um, Chloe and I and others, uh, but predominantly Chloe drafted up a, a few of strategy of what is that we're out to achieve. And that built in with uh, other stuff with a with a, uh, a similar work from the Charitable Trust Fund, where was really what drove a number of things. But one of them was um, the Earl of Wessex saying, "Yes, be master. If that's what the company's doing, and that's the blend of things. And this is what you want me to do." Um, we agreed on six events or what a realistic um, application from him what he could do and <coughs> of course at the same time that work and whether it's interrelated or it is five years ago that might you know others clearly might have a slightly different view but uh, uh, by and large that coalesced into what we're doing now the fixed term chairman for the gpc because i, I, I felt pretty early that it turning around didn't lead to the continuity and the, and the planning that you need to run a growing organization um <clears throat> and that has been pretty successful i should add that um any bright ideas i had uh, rebounded in this doubled the amount of work i have to do um uh, or, or try to do but it i i, I think that um the end result of that work for Prince Edward, the end result of Chloe's strategy work is a company in a very good place. Um, the, the subcommittees were an opportunity for the wider membership to get involved, uh, doing really proper work because of the business approach of the, of the chairman and the members. Um, and they're all uh, to produce a, a company that's really professionally relevant and worthwhile joining if you're a young professional in the energy in industry. <coughs> I think the way they bolt into the Energy Institute, for instance, uh, with EY, now with Imperial College, are all important things if you want to develop as an organisation. 
I think that so that professional side um, I've admired since I first got involved with a few years. I've got industry group and the conversations, um, even if you know nothing really at all about the energy world, um, it, you learn from them. And I can now have a relatively intelligent conversation about energy with, with people who know less than me, which is a, a substantial number of the population, amazingly, um, after the, the uh, privileges, benefits of sitting in on conversations. And of course, the conference last year was fabulous. I think um, uh, I think the advantage with Imperial College went very well the other day, and that's something else that can be developed and uh, things along those lines. And, and the level of industry visits, even though I haven't been on too many of them, um, they are they are just what our younger members or the look for as how they develop their networks, how they build their own understanding. So I think the company's in a really, really good shape. May I talk a little about the Charitable Trust Fund? Yes, please, too. Yeah. So the Charitable Trust Fund, um, I think, um, uh, for a variety of reasons, the trustees are, are superb. It's, it, it's just about the best bunch of trustees I've seen in a, in a small charity in terms of their understanding of what's required and a business-like approach to it all. Um, there's a tendency in smaller charities to think it's, to forget that actually you're dealing with large amounts of money in important subjects. And the same principle should apply in the charity as they do in business. But unfortunately too often that gets forgotten. That's true. I think the, 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 the general level of support scrutiny um, uh, has become uh, outstanding. And um, I think the six projects work that for the raw year it, 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 it is, is superb, it, it's excellent. And I would encourage anybody who hasn't donated uh, in time or, or, or finance to, to, to track it because it's doing good at a time where we really do need to be helping our young people. But the span running from Platanos School through to um, young people, not necessarily so young people doing master's degrees, um, is a pretty wide span, but it's all encouraging them to uh, make the most of themselves and with any luck come and um, join the energy industry, which when it comes back to it is what we're all here for, to promote the energy industry. So uh, I, I, I'm a huge advocate of the charitable trust work. Um, uh, I think um, on the formal side of the company, uh, I, I will say, and it's no secret, that I think that the balance of the company between the informal and the formal, if you look at it as a beam, is possibly a little bit more on the formal side, not enough on the informal, um, but we try and work on that. But the formal is huge fun, and I love it. And I have to say, um, the the installation last year at Mansion House, um, with our small team who we built up over five years of, of, uh, of Joanna and Kristen and the uh, team at Mansion House, <clears throat> and um, we had a whale of a time as well organising it and watching it going so well. So that I think in terms of organising stuff, that was right up there for me in, in other stuff I've done because it all went so well. But I, I could look around and see 300 odd people having a great time as well, which, um, which um, makes it all worth it, especially the uh, when we actually did finish and headed off over the road. We ended up with a huge bunch of viewers, the six of us because their husbands came too. Um, and a fantastic after game beer. It was a great occasion. Um, and so what about the future viewers? Um, I think that uh, membership is growing. I think Alan Diadell and Dermot, who sadly has to leave us now, Alan Diadell has, as we talked about, uh, used business methods to market the fumes and persistence and um, persistence and, as I said, a business approach to marketing has kept us with more members than we started the year with, whereas at one point we were anticipating losing members as a result of 
the ghastly business that's going on at the moment. And while that may still prove to be the case, um, the fact that we're where we are, and that with the Allen's methodologies, and then with Guy Sawyer coming in to look at how we keep members, and the hard work of industry, well, I, I could go through the whole lot really, are all, all adding to the why become a funeral question, um, are all giving answers to why should I become a funeral? And um, I, I think it's, it, the company stands in very good stead. And if we can get past this ghastly business now, um, the professional side that the company has stood up, um, as has the charity of the cluster, and I mean, the professional side has stood up, has kept grinding out despite all the handicaps. <coughs> I think it stands in very good stead for when life returns to whatever normal becomes. Indeed, indeed. Bill, that's been absolutely fascinating, and I, I echo your sentiments uh, completely. I think that the uh, fuelers, uh, because of uh, your tremendous input and the input of others, uh, uh, we're in a, a tremendous uh, place now to, to push forward. I think that uh, our livery company and our, our industry is so relevant to, uh, to things that have to happen over the next 30 years. And, uh, and we're in the right place to, uh, to lead uh, in many respects um, to ensure that we achieve these long-term objectives. But people will be fascinated with what you told us uh, over the last half an hour or so, Bill. It's been absolutely uh, fantastic. And, uh, um, and uh, we hope that we all get together uh, physically in the not too distant future. Uh, Zoom is, is super, but uh, there's nothing quite like uh, standing in a bar and having a pint. I think you would agree. Would I agree? <laughs> um, my